Well, warmest greetings to you and thank you for allowing me to be part of your gathering for worship today. I'm obsessed with, well, I wonder if you can work it out what I'm obsessed with. Perhaps if you look a bit more closely onto and into the picture on this video, you might guess. In the far corner of the picture is a book which was given to me by a very good friend because he knows of my interest in this particular subject. I'm obsessed with kingfishers and wherever my wife and I go we always look up where there might be a river where we might catch sight of a kingfisher. You can't never guarantee it, it's uh, always serendipitous and grace when you see one but you can do some things which make it more likely. So. Quite recently, we went to the Limington River, just at Boulder in the New Forest, and walked along the Limington River until we found a place where there was a fallen trunk stretching out across the water, an ideal perching place for a kingfish to sit on and look down into the water to see if there were any fish that it could dive into to catch. We'd literally only been there five minutes and suddenly there was the spread of the kingfisher's back on the side of the trunk and it was hanging on side on so we saw a perfect view of its back and its iridescent blue stripe and then suddenly it dropped from the trunk into the water, caught a fish, flew off into the bushes. A wonderful gift but something which you can never guarantee will happen. But the kingfisher's object is to find a good perching spot which is going to make a dive as straightforward as possible. Today I want us to think particularly about Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus who is famous for finding a good spot to perch up a sycamore tree because he's wanting to see Jesus who he's heard about. Zacchaeus who is a tax collector and rich we're told in Luke 19. The two go together because he works in collaboration with and for the Romans, perhaps he even bribes them in order to be able to be allowed to be a tax collector, but of course the benefit of that for him would be that um, he could uh, charge more than uh, might be strictly necessary as Jewish people who were occupied by the Romans had to pay their dues. Because he collaborated, of course, he was Persona non grata. He was excluded. It was a different sort of social distancing, but he was definitely not everybody's mate. In fact, far from it. So when we read that actually he was short of stature and therefore climbed a tree, there's probably more to it than that. It's not just that he was short, but actually if you're short, you can get to the front of the crowd. But for him to go to the front of the crowd to see Jesus, who's known to be coming further into Jericho, for him to do that... Uh, would be also to invite further abuse and ridicule and contempt from other people. So there's a double safety and a double purpose for him being perched up this tree. What's interesting is that even though he's on the margins and excluded perhaps from uh, regular life amongst Jewish people and colleagues and compatriots, actually he is still very interested in this Jesus. He's spiritually hungry, is what we're led to believe. We've already been told about a blind man who has already started following Jesus on the road into Jericho as he's found healing. And now we're told about someone who hasn't got to beg for a living, but actually is really comfortable, but he's also hungry and thirsty for spiritual life and meaning. One of the things that's been really interesting about this time of lockdown is just how many people have been uh, coming on to online services to have a look and to see what's being said and what's being shared, what the whole faith Christian experience thing is about and whether there's anything that's of interest. We know that the figures are uh, perhaps three to four times as many people as who would regularly be in church services actually have hooked into online and Zoom services, however it's been done. 
What that means is that there's a huge interest spiritually, but people need to find a place where they can perch safely, accessibly, and where they can go at their own pace in their uh, exploring of spiritual life and meaning and of faith. When we ask, though, what this passage is about, it's of course about Zacchaeus, but it's also, isn't it about Jesus? And it's about Jesus because uh, getting up your perch and uh, looking down and trying to stay safe and obscured perhaps by the leaves is one thing. But when Jesus says to Zacchaeus, uh, Zacchaeus, uh, hurry and come down for my stay at, I must stay at your house today, uh, suddenly it's taken on a whole new dynamic. Where Zacchaeus could, as it were, just sort of look in, now he's asked to make a response. And Jesus wants to go and be in his house. Just to notice that the end of this story is one where Jesus says, Today salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house because he too is a son of Abraham. The end of the story, which is worth noticing now, is that there's a spiritual and a, a life transformation transformation that goes on. So my question is, how does that transformation work? We've already noticed the need sometimes to be able to look in without too much early commitment about what faith's about and what God is about, what Jesus is about. But how does the transformation bit work? And what's interesting to me is that, and th th I want to say this really clearly, Jesus is not about sin management, but about spiritual transformation. And of course, spiritual transformation leads to us addressing the things that are not of God. So Jesus says, he too is a son of Abraham. Why does he say that? Well, he says it because Zacchaeus' response to the presence of Jesus is so transformed, so like human beings are meant to live, that actually Jesus can see he's living out what it means to truly be a daughter or a son of Abraham. In other words, to be one of God's people. And salvation is defined in that sense. It's a total and utter life-changing response to who Jesus is. It's not about clutching on to something uh, beyond death or where we go to heaven. That's not ever how Jesus sees it. So there's something extraordinary about this tree with a view, which leads to a table with intimacy. And the table is Zacchaeus' his own table. He hurries down from the tree and is happy to welcome Jesus. Of course, there's then a load of criticism about what Jesus is doing. And in the end, Jesus says, do you know what? This is what I'm about. I came to seek out and to save those who are on the margins, who are lost. But nonetheless, there is this welcome from Zacchaeus and Jesus goes to be the guest of one who is a known sinner. In other words, he's not tolerated in Jewish society at that time because of his compromise with the Romans and because of his siphoning off money for his own pocket. And whatever takes place in this dinner conversation, what we, what we do see resulting from it is that intimacy with Jesus, being at table with him, is enough to transform a person who presumably is deeply wedded and very comfortable with their life at that point. And so Zacchaeus says, look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Well, four times as much was the standard in those days. That was the standard compensation. But he does more than simply acknowledge the possibility that he will have behaved inappropriately with other people's money and put them into an even worse position by taking more than is due in their taxes. He also says he's going to do something 
which actually helps the poor to be in a better position. I will give half of my possessions, Lord, to the poor. Now, at this point, we could say, well, he was obviously very rich. It didn't really matter that much to him. Really? My experience is that all of us, however much or little we have, do find it still hard to let go of what we've got. And half is quite a lot. So I think actually we need to give, as Jesus does, Zacchaeus some credit here. What's extraordinary for um, our purposes is that the transformation takes place over a table. And one of the other things that's really interesting about lockdown is that it's the smaller groups, the intimate relationships, where we've been working out what it means to really be church and do church. It's the uh, small Zoom groups. It's the being able to meet up to six people. It's the um, household size, the small household size, which have been the ways in which we've had at least some sense of deeper relationship and connecting, whether it's been online or increasingly as it becomes possible face-to-face, -face, albeit with uh, with uh, care. And in a way, we're going back to something that's always been true of the Christian church, which is that in houses, in rooms, over meals is the way in which people really express their faith and they deepen their faith and they work out their discipleship. Now, um, what's interesting about that is, uh, as we go forward, um, we might ask ourselves, what does that mean for us in terms of how we do church? If we've always said the main thing was Sunday, what if it is that Sunday, of course, gathering uh, in a larger group for worship is something that will always be a priority for us. But what about if the main way we express our faith in God and work out what it means to live the whole of life before God. What about if it's in a smaller group? And sometimes we might have to make that an online group. And perhaps those that are exploring faith, that might be their way in. Worth asking the question. And in this case, what, um, uh, what stays in the room, uh, or happens in the room, doesn't stay in the room. Uh, what happens in the Zoom doesn't stay in the Zoom. Because... Instead of pious words from Zacchaeus, what he actually does is he expresses something which reaches well beyond the intimacy of the occasion with Jesus and actually means it's going to touch people who are poor, people that have been treated unjustly, people that need compensating because of the decisions he's made. What's extraordinary is this leads to transformative justice. There's been a tree with a view. There's been uh, uh, intimacy at table with Jesus, but it goes beyond that. There's a transformed and a just person that emerges from this whole experience. Justice, something that we've been increasingly been aware of for those that are not paid or honoured well in terms of their regular work. For those because of their skin colour or any other reason who are marginalised and not included and are... Uh, uh, pushed away. Justice where we live justly in how we treat others personally, but also justice that we pursue because we know that sometimes it's embedded in the systems and structures of society and it won't do to keep on making excuses about not doing anything about it. That's the heart of what it means to be a member of the people of God, says Jesus. That is an expression of salvation coming to a house when actually we do something beyond our house, <laughs> which actually uh, addresses how we live justly and how we treat others. And uh, the great thing about homes and rooms and all of those things, as we've experienced, is that it's very regular, it's very messy. It's a great metaphor. What's been extraordinary is, that, of course, I mean, you may be watching this now in your pyjamas uh, and eating your breakfast. And um, I've no idea what your room looks like around you. And you're probably, you might be quite glad that I don't. And uh, life is messy. And yet through Zoom and through online stuff, thinking about Jesus, wondering what it means to respond to Jesus with others or through a service like this, comes right into the heart of our houses, into our mess and our ordinariness. I, I really like that. That's very of God.
It does remind me again of the Kingfisher, of course, because one of the things that I've learned is that that uh, up to a metre long mud burrow, which uh, is in the side of a riverbank where a Kingfisher um, lives and, and where they raise their chicks, is pretty grotty. Not only is it made of mud, but actually when you get down to the bottom of it, you've got chicks who are constantly being fed little fish. And, uh, well, you can imagine, they produce some stuff because they're eating the fish, and actually it's pretty smelly down there, and full of little bones from fish and so on. It's not a great sight if you were able to get in there and see, and some clever camera work has allowed us to see in there. But still, it's in the heart of our mess that God is interested in transforming us. So, what an extraordinary story. At the heart of it is just the sheer love and compassion and grace and noticing and welcome of Jesus, isn't it? When we ask what transforms a person, it's not about techniques. It's not about uh, cleverly presented apologetics. What transforms people, in my experience, and what's changed me, I've got a long way to go, is the extraordinary presence of the living God discovered in Jesus. So, I'm back to the kingfisher again. And to the fact that it can look quite ordinary from a distance. I caught sight of one over Blashford Lakes, again in another part of the New Forest, not that long ago. And it was flying back over the main road to back to the river. And from a distance, I could only see from below. So there was obviously some blues, but mainly it was a sort of orange, or looked a bit muddy orange actually from a distance, but it was definitely the shape of a kingfisher. But if you see uh, a kingfisher flying ahead of you along a river, or if it's below you as you're on the bank, it's an entirely different experience because you see its back. You see that extraordinary, exquisite, dazzling blue. And what really changes it, what really makes it stunning, is if the sun is out and catches its back. There's a famous poem called As Kingfishers Catch Fire, which is really a reference to that effect. It's by Gerard Manley Hopkins. And in it, he talks about the kingfisher catching fire and dragonfly drawing flame. And he's really saying, their uh, particular distinctive, their beauty, what's great about them is what, what is meant to be. That's how they're designed to be. And he says that's all important and how it's meant to be and of God. But then he goes on to say that when it comes to human beings, there's also a how we're meant to be and how we're supposed to be. And he says that uh, human beings can be in God's eye what they're meant to be. And it happens through Christ. Christ, who in every human being can play potentially in 10,000 places so that the very features of human beings' faces can be an expression of God. What is it that transforms human beings? It's when we get caught by the sun. It's when we experience that intimacy with him. And it's that which takes us as seekers, which enables us to deepen our relationship with one another and with him, and which transforms us into those who seek to bless and to help all other people flourish, to live justly ourselves and to seek it and pursue it for others as well. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you that you notice us, you seek us out, you call us to discover your love and compassion. As we respond, we find ourselves increasingly, as the Spirit helps us, transformed into your very image. 
those who seek to bless others, to live justly with all others, and to pursue justice where it's not yet happened. Thank you, Lord. Help us to know what to do with our sense of your presence afresh today and going forward as we share our lives and our discipleship with others. In your name we pray. Amen.